Thank you for joining us. This is Shira Goldberg. I am your host. This is the fifth uh, season of The Addiction Show, so we're really proud of that. We got a little high tech this time, so this is going to be a, a nightmare about for the first half of the season. <laughs> Zach's our guinea pig, so thank you, Zach, for showing up, and uh, it's great to see you. Hey, you too. Good to be with you. Thanks for letting me be the guinea pig. <laughs> so I know you from online, and you're, uh, you just came out of nowhere on my news feed, and I was like, <laughs> who, who is this guy? I want to know him. So tell us a little bit about yourself, and I know you're on the East Coast, so um, besides that, and the accent's not as bad as I thought. Um, no, what, what did you think do you What did you think it was going to be? <laughs> I don't know. I I always think of the Kennedys when I think of um, the East Coast. Either that or Goodfellas. So yeah, we it it goes varies in Vermont here. Well, I, I am in Vermont and I work at a high school in Vermont. I'm a behaviorist, so that's what I do, and I work as a behavior consultant for kids and families. Um, the what probably the reason why I came out of nowhere to you is because my work in child development is such that. I use a skills-based program, so I, you know, work with kids on whatever skills they have, and try to uh, get them out into the world in whatever respect makes sense to them. And that coincided really nicely with addiction and my framework for dealing with people with addiction too. So that's interesting. That's similar to my background, um, applied behavior analysis. So I think there's a certain you have a certain. Uh, uh, something like different characteristics or but yeah a lot of us have a very similar uh, background as far as like we're uh, analytical or um, there's some applied behavioral stuff going on there <laughs> and that works well when you're trying to change your life right well, I guess so I mean the thing that I do with kids and with human beings in general just works nicely. By the way, I had a pretty serious addiction to opiates, including heroin. So I should mention Did you that. Really? That's, yeah. I really did. And so I should mention that's how I got super interested in it. And I started. I was going to write a book about my own experience. And I'm also. I am an analytical thinker. So what I started noticing was that being having experienced addiction makes me nothing of an expert in the field. Yeah. So you know, I had to get involved and start being an expert. You know. Um, <laughs> But what I, my work in development, the very work kind of meeting people where they're at and taking stepping stones to yeah. try to address their values and skills is exactly the approach I take with addiction. It's why I'm uh, now working with Stanton Peel on a publication, and it works uh, with respect to his program, too. It's the antithesis of and the antidote to the disease model, which we both speak out against pretty loudly. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I think I'm confusing everybody. I wrote um, about disease, but I put dis-ease. Um, yeah, that can... Yeah. I am, you know, it's a, for me, it's like a pendulum. When I first got into this, it was like, you know, a far, a far extreme in one direction. And it just reminds me of those balls on someone's desk in the 70s with the force, you know. It, like, it takes all the energy and transfers yeah. it to the other side, which is extreme. So, you know, I'm just leveling it out and... Um, but for uh, for those that don't know who Stanton Peel is, besides Gabor Mate's absolute best friend, tell us a little <laughs> bit about him. <laughs> he is, man. He's Gabor's best friend. Uh, he's written. Uh, yeah, so I went to a Gabor training. Let's just start there. I went okay. to a Gabor Mate training. I think Gabor Mate it speaks a lot of sense about uh, addiction and just the roots of it all. What I don't agree with with Gabor is the extent to which he talks about trauma. And mm -hmm. so when I went to a training of his, I noticed a little bit of charlatanism. Like, I, I understand where he's coming from with trauma, and I will say that like 98% of, of the things he says are not only like elegantly put, but so true. Like, mm -hmm. he does a lot of really good in the world. Um, but I did notice him, he did this sort of an act where he tried to ask people, um, do you, has anybody here had an addiction or an adverse experience who thinks it's not from trauma? And so a guy raised his hand, and he did this thing. I won't go into it, but he ended up convincing this guy that he had trauma. He just didn't know it. And so from my perspective and what I do with kids and what, how I work with people, 
that's not a good starting point. Like, let's dig out the trauma. So mm -hmm. I got super interested in Gabor. I didn't know much about him except I read uh, in the realm of hungry ghosts before I went to the training. And so I looked for any critique of his work. And not because I dislike him. Uh, like, I just do that with all right. sort of scientific claims. And Stanton was the only person to write to speak out against him. And he wrote these articles. The one's called uh, The Seductive and Dangerous Allure of Gabor Mate. And one is called My Hostile Breakfast with Gabor Mate, <laughs> where they went, they sat and had breakfast together in, uh, uh, I guess it was in Vancouver, I don't know. But they sat and had breakfast, and the first thing Gabor says to him is, Stanton, you have deep-rooted trauma. <laughs> and it just, it just didn't go well from there. Um, but Stanton and I, since we talked about it, I got a hold of him so that he could be on my show, the Young Justice podcast. And uh, we really hit it off, and we have a lot in common. We disagree on a lot, too. But one of the things uh, that works with us is we're kind of the yin and yang. He has a, okay. just he crafts his arguments so well, and then he makes it so that like in real time you really can't say much against him. You got to work pretty hard to get a word in. And my approach is <laughs> somewhat opposite, where I actually um, like to normalize my opponent's point of view or different points of view before I engage, and so that works for our writing styles. I think he's so scary. Um, he's <laughs> because he's so smart, and yeah. he's—I mean—he's like brilliant. He's the oh, half yeah. of the village people by himself. He's an attorney. <laughs> he's like a business entrepreneur. He's an author. He's—I um, mean, I'm missing about four other ones at least. But he is really um, in your face about how he sees things, and. Not everybody's uh, comfortable with that, and it it's uh, could be misconstrued as off putting. But he, I mean, he does he does have uh, definitely his point of view, and it's uh, I've heard this with him. Um, he throws the baby out with the bathwater, so I get to talk to him about that myself. But what do you think about that? Do you think his approach is um, could be softer, or is it? That's what we need, kind of like a slap in the face, a reality check. What's your take on that? Yeah, I don't know. I think that his way of coming across and explaining his information and ideas is one of many approaches that we probably do need mm -hmm. um, just to kind of spread reason. I understand. I've talked to him about this, too. Like, I understand the idea of him being kind of cantankerous, maybe <laughs> too barbed when he speaks. Uh -huh. But it's like... I don't know. I, I can't imagine because I've been in what, doing what I'm doing for about 12 years and with some success, but something like addiction, when you have a view like his that, you know, he spoke out against AA and the disease model, uh, the, the chronic brain disease model specifically, like 40 years ago I know. When, when everybody hated him just for speaking his mind or delivering information. Mm -hmm. It's almost mm -hmm. like, you know, you go to survival mode in the area of intellectual discourse. So you either are, you know, he could have been like shut up or like he could have just, you know, put the pedal to the metal like he did. And I think that's just his approach now, somewhat his personality, but he's actually a, a reasonable, good, friendly guy. It's just like, you know, when you have some, when he's talking about people dying, living or dying and he has an opinion, uh, I don't know. I guess I get it. I get what people are saying, but I, I also think he's a very important person in the field. Now, I did not realize until um, I read up a little bit about you that you were one of his coaches. Yes, I work in his life process program. That's fantastic. So what is that? Because we are hearing about coaching. I mean, everybody's a coach all of a sudden. It's like yeah. the new thing, that and uh, uh, gluten-free, I think, are the <laughs> two important yeah. things I need to know in this decade. So what, what is that about? Well, it's just an approach to, it's a way to make contact with people, and it's mm -hmm. not a rehab. It's like anti-disease, uh, <laughs> however, well, however far away you can get from a chronic brain disease model where you have this illness and you're, you'll have it forever. Uh -huh. I mean, it just, it goes through the approach that, like, you start out, you can start out with 80 to 90 percent of people who do drugs. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but any drugs, heroin included, don't become addicted to them. They use them without any real social or psychological problem. Mm -hmm. And then of the people who become addicted, we have very good data. It's all the data 
Uh, NISARC is uh, one of the surveys of 43,000 people. It's a really representative sample. And it's been done twice. We have two sets. And everything before and after shows that people who do become addicted, around 80% of them or so, discontinue their harmful behavior over time. Mm -hmm. And so, like, what people have done, and I think that he doesn't like and I don't like about the chronic brain disease model at its extreme, is it's extrapolated from the minority people who have the worst kinds of addictions and life experiences and said, oh, well, if this is the life experience of people who stay addicted forever, then that must mean it's true for everybody. So everyone's addicted forever. Right. And we go the opposite route. We generalize from, we try to understand what worked for all of these people who, uh, why didn't all these people become addicted at first? And what worked for all of these people who uh, discontinue destructive behavior on their own? And so to do that, it just comes down to life experience. And it's all about making values choices. And some people are can make choices freely, more or less freely. And we just try to give the support for people to pick up whatever resources are missing or values, skills, and connections. And so that's what we do. But people come and talk to us. We try to lead them through um, they can we can do one on one Skype calls. It's remote, um, and we talk online, we chat, and things like that, just to try to get people on the positive side of life's balancing act. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, the, my go-to um, Stanton was a little scary, but I came across Dr. Carl Hart, and mm. he pretty much says the same thing. Um, one of the things that I really resonated with me was the part where we have such racist um, agendas, you know, that have been perpetuated throughout the decades, you know, starting with like, ooh, wait a minute, this is scary, let's let's put uh, Reefer Madness up as a propaganda statement, and yeah. you know, he's the one who really started helping me feel comfortable breaking things down, because I was like, yeah, that's true, why is it that all of the drugs that most people get um, in trouble for are the least harmful to them and they get the you know um, like certain certain demographics I would say you know like in the in the 80s with crack cocaine how you yeah. would get arrested uh, you had a five times greater chance if you were a black male versus cocaine and it's very similar uh, chemically same with uh, meth and mm. is it meth? Which one? I'm getting all my drugs mixed up. But it's like, it's just a very specific target. And I have, I mean, what can we do? What can we do about that? Or what are we doing wrong? Yeah, I don't know, man. In terms of policy, that that's tough for me too. Because you have, you've got to start at the point where, why can people drink alcohol that causes death? Yeah. Actually, I, I should say it's a good idea that we are not still living in prohibition of alcohol. So, like, why are people able to drink alcohol with some harm reduction restrictions, but people, and they can do that extemporaneously, like ad nauseum, mm -hmm. but people yeah. who do drugs that seem to have vast utility, <laughs> meth included, like, mm -hmm. because we know that Adderall with, it has just an extra yeah, methyl fruit right. uh, and meth, you know, the Adderall is used with incredible utility, and, I mean, it's everywhere. So what we do about it, man, I, do, I don't know. I'm just I'm trying to get some truth out there and hope that uh, people who are better at making policy help me. <laughs> yeah, I'm very interested in, in that, and I've become kind of a, an advocate. Um, I've seen it. I just keep seeing it, the realities of certain people. It's like you just can't get out of that loop, and that's what's happening you get caught up in the in the system, and then it, you get sucked back into it. Like here in Napa, for example, uh, I'm going to do some investigation. But the only game in town is the Geo Group, which mm. Trump has some interest in that, um, and they're the number one <laughs> profiteer of the prison systems that are private, but. Yeah. When you get out of prison, their prison, you come to their, um, you know, rehabilitation, acclimation back into your, into your uh, world, 
So they got you coming and going. And then you're going to probably loop back around again. So it's like, how is that even, you know, like in that, people had to vote for that and to get them, get that contract. And this is, you know, this isn't uh, some backwards hillbilly, sorry about if I'm offending the hillbillies, but, you know, it's like, this is real life. This is happening. We're no, we're, we're not special. And this is in almost every state. So I think there's some, something's got to give. <laughs> and considering we're the number one as far as who we put away, now we're even uh, at record numbers for women. It's like you can't break the family down fast enough. So it, we've got such challenges. Um, what I've thought of was we really are at such limited means as far as, you know, I mean, we can't, we can't lose anymore. We're all starting to just say, you know what? We need to pick up something and like run with it. So I think there's a sense of doing something, but we don't know what to do. So mm -hmm. I see a lot of uh, a lot of people taking the reins. Like Stanton has set that precedent for the past forty years. But you know, people are starting to to say, I don't know what to do. But if there's somebody else that knows, you know, they'll they'll back them and. You know, I think that's that's a good move. But then, who are we backing? So, because we've well, got it's a good example of streams. like it, it's a good example of our the way that Stanton and I have a different approach mm -hmm. to trying to figure out problems. I like to solve problems. I guess by nature in my work, I'm working with teachers and families and kids, like outside of the addiction round, just in my work in development. Mm -hmm. And I'm not always working with people who I think are reasonable people. And the only game that I have is to get in touch with whatever values or ideas that we that work with both of us somewhat and i've been thinking about this since you mentioned it the other day uh, about private prisons i mean it just would be interesting if we could get on the level of saying i mean i think people are going to need to speak out against them too uh, because it, it's a bad idea it's harming <laughs> lives but i wonder if we start to use that harm re uh, harm reduction approach with respect to private prisons and say something like i wonder if private prisons are here to stay but if we can re-incentivize them so their incentives maybe they profit on um getting people reintegrated into the community and maybe that would mm. help them step up ideas about uh how to actually do that reasonable ideas i think I think a lot of people in the prison industry are, like you said, uh, understanding that they're looping people through that system so they gain purchase on them. Right. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. You know, it's like sometimes the solution might just be <laughs> presented in a different way. I I think of it as that that uh, old story about the five uh, blind men touching the elephant. And, you know, that's how we are right now. Everybody's arguing what's what's right what's best and it's like but we are all state you know positioned but if you if you're open to you know just looking at it from a different perspective i think you know we're seeing some solutions some or at least some um suggestions i wouldn't say solutions but yeah that's that's true because um something's got to give besides our besides our uh, entire country at peril with the the risk of uh, being in prison. It's so, tough. It's tough to have dichotomies just all mm -hmm. around politically and within subsets of arguments. I'm on a committee here uh, in Vermont. It's a countywide committee for, it's called the Chittenden County Opioid Alliance. And like just in the name does something I don't like to do, which sort of starts demonizing the drug itself. Um, but I'm part of it and there's like super smart people and like everyone <laughs> daily in our community is on this uh -huh. board. And the way I have to have conversations with them are they have, they first of all know that my ideas are goofy and not like theirs. Mm -hmm. Like I I don't think that talking about addiction like it's a sickness is a good idea. I don't think we're going to end up making a complete progress. But I mean, what progress am I going to make if I go in only saying that when they right. argue with me? Instead, we have conversations like what I like about talking about it as a sickness where I think they're going with it is that it lessens the stigma. You know, we used to have a severe allergy to people with addictions and call them just horrible people, you know, lack of morality. And I like that talking about people as if they're sick because obviously there's some sort of 
disorder in their life does take yeah. away some stigma. So it's I like where they're coming from. And if I can just have them understand that we are on the same ground for wanting to reduce stigma and wanting to save lives, then that's when the conversations become fruitful. So I yeah. think it's tough for everybody. There's a dichotomy yeah. in the addiction field, a dichotomy in politics. I think it's tough for people to say, to just relent for a second and say, yeah, I agree with you on this. Let's work it out. Right. Yeah, I always thought I need a, in order to change things, I need to be invited. I need to be, you know, invited to the party, get to know people, have them get to know me. And mm -hmm. one of the funny things that's really happened to me, I'm very proud of, uh, you know, I love and celebrate diversity. And then one of my friends said as a joke, yeah, as long as they agree with you. And <laughs> I was like, that's so true, you know, because I, yeah. I, I couldn't imagine anyone not agreeing with me. So Imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So come to find out, lots of people disagree with me. But I wasn't able to, you know, really recognize the value in that. It's a, it's a great way to not only stay informed what what their opinions are about, but to kind of articulate mine in a way that people will just be open to listening to. Because we can't totally. have change if we're not, if you know, we're one extreme to the to the next. So. Totally yeah. agree. I interviewed a woman named Carol Tabris. She's a social psychologist. She wrote the book, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me. I don't know if you've heard of that. Uh -huh. And it's a book all about cognitive dissonance. And that's uh -huh. sort of the thesis of her book is that, you know, just like uh, global warming skeptics or people who are skeptics of people who think global warming is real, you know, uh -huh. uh, you present them with the best evidence you got and it just makes them stick with their point, you know, double down on their idea in the first place. Dissonance is just such that if something comes into conflict with an already, you know, an idea you already have, it damages your sense of self to hear that. You have to mm -hmm. reduce it somehow. And so the only way really to come up against that is to get in touch with that person emotionally and then start to have an intellectual conversation. Very good point. And I've, no, I've realized that myself because uh, it seems so visceral. If, mm -hmm. if, if you are talking about, you know, um, and it could be misconstrued as a you know negative um, for recovery or the twelve steps. People are really really uh, protective over that, and I was wondering. It was so you know interesting to me that it's uh, an. Ex I said, what what is it? There's something like it's an extension of themselves, or it was a time where they're eternally grateful and humble, and you know, and so I was like, that is a good point because. I have been on person first language for quite a while and you know through like the American Disabilities Act in 1990 I mean and even before then before I was acknowledged it's uh, you know I always thought I want to be identified just as me first and then whatever you know connotation but this is always a constant you know and other things and labels that they come, they go, you know, but when you're identifying with it at that level, yeah, I can see how it would sound like it was uh, disrespectful in some way. So I get, I, yeah, I get some criticism for engaging in ideas that people think are bad. Like, probably the most mm -hmm. criticism I got is I had, this has nothing to do with addiction, but I had Charles Murray on the show. Um, when Charles Murray came to deliver a speech at Middlebury College, which is really close to where I live, uh, he got uh, booed off stage and also there was violent protests against him because he wrote this book, The Bell Curve, about, and this, one of oh, the pieces yeah. of The Bell Curve was that. Yes. And yeah. so, you know, I, the reason I bring it up is because what you're saying is so true. First of all, it's when you talk about a person, talk to a person and let them be themselves, let them define who they are. Yeah. Well, you're going to, you're going to get a better conversation. <laughs> and then also talking to somebody like Charles Murray, if you completely disagree with them, it's interesting because I did completely disagree with them. I, uh, but when push came to shove, I didn't quite know how I was going to argue with him. So instead of doing that, I cashed out my disagreement in the form of just letting him explain his ideas to me. 
And it turns out, you know, I still disagree with his thesis that, um, you know, if African Americans are standard deviation uh, lower in IQ in, in general than white Americans, okay, well, I, and he's saying that that's not so much to do with environment. Okay, I disagree with that. But I agree now that he was doing honest science. Like, he wasn't trying to make a big race claim, and he's not racist. Now that I know him, he's a good guy. And mm -hmm. so it helped me understand his argument and understand where he's coming from. I just never would have had any of that understanding. And he made me think about a lot of stuff. So it's like you gain a lot from just not trying to push people away so much. Yeah, kill him with, kill him with kindness. Well, when I first <laughs> heard about that book... It just made me realize stats are stupid, so and they can be skewed <laughs> to, they can, to yeah. define, yeah, to create your foundations. Like, well, statistics prove it's like, yeah, yours do. So it's like I'm always wondering, you know, what's your motivation or who's your funding source? But yeah, but yeah. that's like that's why I think free speech is just the most precious of all values. It's mm -hmm. like you write a book that is about statistics, and then you make a claim from those statistics, then you want, and, and especially if it's selling like 300,000 copies like his, his did, you want that person to start speaking so that you can speak out against whatever ideas you think are bad. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see more of that happening with respect to addiction too. Yeah, absolutely. I think we just need all of us because this is a, um, not, a, not a just a, you know, this is the face of recovery right here, you know? It's right. like, it's all of us. It's none of us. It's like we're a collective, and I, I see it as like a huge family. And when we're all to ourselves, we're fighting and we're talking crap about each other. And but soon as someone is like a, like attacked from an outsider, you know, then it's we get kind of cohesive. And hey, you know, you. That's right. You, and I like that. I've noticed that too. So I use that as a kind of a an example of where we're at you know it's like we're a family that yeah we don't get along like a bunch of brothers and sisters and there's some of us that are really extreme and and really know how to pinpoint with laser accuracy you know an argument but we I think we wouldn't we wouldn't be in this pot of you know of all of these brilliant people and brilliant minds and um, just infiltrating the other side and seeing what their point of view is because that's what's going to formulate, you know, where where we go from here. Mm. Well, I liked you did the interview with Monica Richardson yesterday. That was really oh, cool. Oh, you heard that already? I did. I was listening to it live. I actually happened to see it on my feed and I was listening. Um, but I liked the part of the conversation you guys were talking about AA. And obviously, uh -huh. if people don't know Monica, she's, I mean, that is her, yeah. like, bread and butter just forcefully uh, opposing AA and the ills that come with it. Like, and I think that's a good idea. Yeah. I mean, there is a certain a level of dogma that comes with it that almost it's designed not to change, and she's recognizing that and the harms that come with it. And then you have your opinion that is, like, you kind of agree with that, but also you've seen people go to AA, be good people, have helpful <laughs> experiences, and, you know, that works. So why are you going to fight something that works. So it was interesting to hear even like a disagreement like that, just be able to be expressed kindly because we have so many common values and ideas. Yeah, I almost felt like I let her down because she asked me, um, have you flipped or like she said it like something like, no. <laughs> has thou betrayed me? Right. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, I hope not. And, but that was like five years ago and um, you know, I, I didn't know what worked for me and I'm sure Everybody has something different to offer, but my whole point is, you know, I don't have, I'm not a scorn lover with AA. I don't yeah. have any ill, anything toward it, but I know I can think for myself, and um, I chose another option that resonated with me, because, you know, when you're there, you need something that clicks, and therapy worked for me, and I really was able to really see what the problem was, that I was trying to find a solution drinking, and then come to find out that turned into the problem, made everything work. You know, so it's like just untangling all that mess. So whatever is at your disposal, I think. And, and a lot of people don't have CBT. So I'm glad, you know, Smart Recovery and other, like Stanton Peel's uh, teachings, <laughs> um, that 
you know, a lot of people subscribe to. I, it's just finding what fits for you. So that's why I said I'm not throwing in the towel. You know, we all have different values, experiences. So, hey, that's why it's like recovery a la carte. So. I think of AA the same way I think about religion. And mm -hmm. I hope not to offend anybody who is deeply religious. Um, hopefully this does the opposite. But religious <laughs> texts, you know, in their true form, are they're bad ideas. I mean, that, that, that is like mother loads of bad ideas come from <laughs> original texts. But religion itself it can be a, like a great experience and a great thing. So mm -hmm. especially as it is like modernized and comes into contact with the 21st century, the problem is any organization or any type of group that has nobody monitoring it and, yeah. you know, or that it doesn't have this sort of self-correcting thing that science has where it, making progress is the rule, not the exception, then there can be offshoots of it that are super dangerous and unhelpful. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, like I think it's hijacked. That, yeah. yeah. So tell us uh, one more time before we we wrap it up about your show and where can we find you because I'm sure you're going to get a lot of interest. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, it's the Young Justice Podcast. It's on Blog Talk Radio. And by the way, it was because I named it that because I uh, started doing it at this really small government access channel near me, and it was a show about child development, and I had to come up with a name on the spot. <laughs> but I named it that, and now I'm committed. But it's called <laughs> The Young Justice Podcast, and it's n now basically about development and mostly addiction. So I talk to addiction experts. You can find that on the Apple Podcast Store or Blog Talk Radio. Um, and I'm still working on cranking out the book with Stanton, so I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about, but just uh, you'll see it soon. And also uh, Vice... Digital News is coming to do an interview with me soon, and I'm not sure when that's coming up, but maybe you could be on the lookout. God. Okay, well, I'll definitely um, post those links because I think you're just such a, a great, insightful, uh, young resource. <laughs> like the young Thank parents. you. Young Justice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank All you. Right. Well, you too. Well, I love you. the stuff you're doing. Oh, thank you. It's always a work in progress, so it gives me some wiggle room. But, yeah, I am nothing but uh, a reflection of what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to learn. So thank you so much, and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much, Shira. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>